This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the Riptide. Visit them online at blickmanengineering.com. Time for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think, Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy, hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. Ah, uh, come on, once more, it's feeling. Uh, okay, all right, I was trying harder that time. Hey, <laughs> howdy, hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. <laughs> greetings, greetings. Oh, man, I don't know how he does it. I, I never never gave it much thought, but he's darn good at that intro. He is, yeah. <laughs> uh. You both are. Uh, I'm Justin Crosley filling in for Jamil Zanishev on Brew Strong today. Um, he is taking care of some health issues, and we want him to get better. Uh, so he just needed some rest. Um, and and he agreed with John and I that the show must go on. So I'm just yep. helping out here uh, so that John and I can keep uh, getting you some Brew Strong info. Very good, yeah. Yeah, it's good to be back and uh, should have a... Should have a good show today. We're going to do some questions and answers from the from the listenership. All yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. We got some uh, questions and answers lined up. Uh, uh, by the way, you can always send your questions into brewstrong at thebrewingnetwork.com. And uh, John and Jamil do a, a, dar- a darn good job. They do try to get to every one of you. Um, just so you know, don't expect to email directly back. Sometimes that might happen. But most often we just do it here on the show. Uh, so send yeah. in your questions yep. for that. Um, yeah, and uh, while we're at it, a big thanks to our, our wonderful sponsor here on Bruce Strong, who's been with us for so long, uh, Blickman Engineering and John Blickman. You can go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Um, and, and Palmer, you, you, we were working on some new projects with him. Yeah, yeah. We've been uh, doing the Anvil line for the last couple of years, yeah. and this is kind of the uh, mid-price point, you know, the Chevrolet compared to the Cadillac or the Blickman systems. Okay. Um, but it gives us a chance to, to get a little bit of more variety out there in terms of brewing equipment. And we've just introducing the Foundry brewing system. It's an all-in-one um, Green Father Robo Brew kind of thing. Um, but with a better user interface and uh, both um, three gallon and five gallon capacities, um, up to I believe 1070 original gravity, maybe even 1075. So, pretty nice system to wow. run on a 110 household current. That sounds awesome. Uh, are we going to see that at HomebrewCon? It'll be there at HomebrewCon. In fact, I think it's available now. Ah. But uh, you'll definitely see it at HomebrewCon. I love this. All right. I can't wait to check that out. You know, uh, at HomebrewCon, actually, uh, as always, we're having our Brewing Network anniversary party. Um, BNA 14. 14 years, Palmer. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, gosh. I remember the first few. Those were fun. (laughs) And uh, ended up back at your house, and I... I was a victim of drunk Jenga, almost. Oh, that's right. That's right. Those were the days. Those were the days. Now I can't even recover from a night like that, John. I know. Me either. We're getting old. (laughs) We are. Uh, But we are having our anniversary party out there. It's Saturday, June 29th. You can get tickets for it now at thebrewingnetwork.com. And I encourage you to go. It's going to be a great time. We've teamed up with Melvin Brewing and More Beer to put on this party. Um, And while we're there, the reason I'm bringing it up now is we're going to be raffling off, giving away our um, More Beer Brewing Network brew sculpture. 
Uh, and, and this thing has some history, uh, you know, built, oh, yeah. it, it was one of the first built, um, at, at more beer and then, uh, was given to Jamil, um, who I think retrofitted it or they retrofitted it for him a couple times. Then he passed it along to, to me and the brewing network. Uh, it's had some, some professionals brew on it. Uh, Matt, Matt Brinelson has brewed on that system and, yeah. um, Dan Gordon. And now we're, we're giving it away to a brewing network listener because we want to keep the momentum of this thing going. We want to keep the tradition alive. Oh yeah, this is the this is the system that brewed many many of the uh, gold medal winning beers that are documented in brewing classic styles. You're right. You're. Uh, in fact, I can't believe I, f- I failed to mention that. You're absolutely right. Um, the, the this system was really. Uh, behind that book behind those recipes uh so it's really got a a great pedigree and um we're going to get it all cleaned up and and ready to pass along so i might need a new system i'm gonna have to check out this anvil yeah check it out at anvilbrewing.com there we go okay all right well um i'm looking forward to seeing everybody out at homebrew con and in the meantime let's do some q a shall we all right so this one came in from a listener, and I'm glad because I have the same questions. I've been I'm having trouble wrapping my head around this, and it's about hop creep. Oh, yes. Um, and listener, listener writes in, uh, you know, I, I've heard this come up on the Brewing Network several times now, this topic, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around the issue surrounding hop creep. And he's got mm-hmm. uh, three questions. And so um, first... Um, and I'll let you uh, tell us what hop creep is in a minute here, John. Well, it's the alter ego for Jamil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, actually. I've se- I think I've seen that uh, alter ego. Uh, so first he asks, uh, what is happening with hop creep? Is it, is it sugars in the hop that are contributing to the creep? Or is it enzymes in the hops that break down long chain sugars, uh, longer chain sugars that are still unfermented in the wort, or maybe both? Yeah, um, that that's a great question. And to the best of my knowledge, I think the majority of it comes from the enzymes in the hops um, acting on the dextrins that are in the beer after fermentation. So, um, yeah, the the hops do have a small amount of sugars, um, but not, I think, not enough to account for the four gravity points up to one degree Plato of further attenuation that it can occur. Um, due to hop creep, and and that's essentially the the easy definition of what hop creep is, right? This yes, okay. It's a, it's a it's an increased attenuation, additional fermentation, if you will, uh, of the beer when it's supposedly done due to dry hopping. Got it. Okay. And so, and we covered this on our new podcast, Hop and Brew School, which you can find here on the Brewing Network as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, th- th- this point is interesting because it seems easy to think that if if this increase in Plato is happening, you must be adding sugar, right? And so the the, the, right. I, the original theory, I guess, is, well, if we're putting hops in and this is happening, they must have sugar. But just so I'm clear, so in the mash, obviously, uh, I hope everybody knows by now, we have this enzymatic activity, um, which yep. uh, that the, the, those enzymes are in the grain. Um, and this happens in the mash, and it breaks down the sugars to, to turn them into fermentable. But it obviously doesn't break them all down. The longer chain sugars tend to stay intact, uh, right? And and there are there are ways to break those down. For example, Britannomyces is is great, right, at, at breaking down some of these longer chain um, sugars. Right. But without the use of of an additional yeast, it, it sounds to me like what you're saying, John, is when we when we dry hop, when we put in these hops, rather than adding sugar, there are additional enzymes within the hops that are able to further break down the sugars in wort? Yes. And it, it's the uh, alpha-glucosidase enzyme, the one that actually nips glucoses off the ends of the sugar chains. So, um you know, going back to basic brewing theory, um, the mash creates lots of maltose, a little bit of maltotriose, the three-chain sugar, and the maltotetriose, the four-chain sugar. The yeast only ferment the single, the glucose, the double, the maltose, and then to a small extent, depending on strain, the maltotriose, the three-sugar uh, sugar. 
So all the other uh, longer sugars are left behind in the beer, and those contribute to residual sweetness and beer flavor. Well, um, the hops, being plants, they have these amylase enzymes just like the barley does. Mm. Um, and one of them is this alpha-glucosidase that is opposed to beta amylase, which nips off a, a maltose, a two-chain or sorry, a, a two molecule sugar from the end of the chain, it nips off a single uh, sugar, glucose. And so this nibbling action uh, starts happening with dry hopping. Got it. Okay. Now, from there, uh, you, you, you may ask yourself, you know, why is this only happening now? Do you occasionally ask yourself that question? Well, <laughs> about uh, about almost everything in my life. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, because this must have been going on through all of the history of brewing, right? So why all of a sudden is it this hot topic? I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, there's a I think there's a couple reasons, and this is largely my own opinion from what I've read, um, but I have been interested in this topic um, with. The increase in craft brewing and the increasing demand in, in for hops with good oil levels, um, higher alpha, and so on, we've we started changing the kinds of hops we're using for dry hopping. Mm. That's step one. In our quest to get more oil from the hops and better hop flavor and aroma, um, we've started lowering the kilning temperatures that are used at the hop supplier when they process the hops, when they're drying them. They're lowering the, the kiln temperature to reduce the loss of the hop oils. You know, you get the, as you're drying the hops and you're trying to, you know, force hot air through them, hmm. uh, you know, you would boil away or, you know, evaporate some of these hop oils. So they're, they started lowering that temperature. And I think in doing so, they are not denaturing these leftover amylase enzymes uh, like they used to in previous decades. I see. Okay. So we're we're getting more we're getting more enzymes coming into the into the or staying with the dry hops, and then of course we're doing more dry hopping than ever before, you know, up to four pounds per barrel instead of just one pound per barrel. Like, right. And even a half pound per barrel, you know, a hundred years ago was considered a lot. Sure. So we're really increasing the amount of these enzymes in the wort, in the, in the finished wort beer, actually, uh, in two ways, uh, both yeah. with the volume of hops that we're putting in and potentially the volume of enzymes that are left um, alive. Alive. Yeah. Got it. OK. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I think that's why we're seeing more of this. So then let me ask this, too. And this was part of his, his question that was written in as well. Mm -hmm. I guess the short question is. So who cares? <laughs> like, so what, if, if it's been happening and we know it happens and we know that the ABV could go up or, or you know, the, the gravity can go up, you know, why is that a problem? Or are there additional problems like off flavors that we're seeing with this? Yeah. Well, there, there, yeah, there's those are both uh, good, good questions. We are seeing we do see issues with the increased attenuation, the little extra boost in alcohol. Um, it's a small change, but depending on the state that a brewery may be in, um, they may have trouble with their truth and labeling laws. Uh, you know, yeah. if, the, if the percent alcohol, the ABV changes by a tenth of a percent due to hop creep, and they, you know, they have a different value on their label or in their official filing with the TTB, that could be an issue. Um, so, and that, and I'm not a legal expert by any means. So, yeah. um, the degree of that issue is, is beyond my knowledge, but that, that, that potential could issue be. is there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the home brewer for, from a quality point of view, um, the very real issue that a lot of brewers ran into, and this I, I started getting questions about this oh, about three or four years ago, um, 
brewer would email me and say, hey, you know, we're having diacetyl problems with our beer. Um, we're making this IPA. We we do our VDK test. Once the VDK test comes back negative, we dry hop. When dry hopping's done, we cool it, package it, ship it out. And then like two weeks later, the customer calls up and said, hey, we've got diacetyl uh, in the beer. What's, what's, the, what's the story? Mm. And um, that, you know, for a while puzzled me. But as we start understanding what diacetyl is, um, and how it's formed, it becomes uh, it, it becomes clear. Uh, when you have hop creep, you're generating uh, small amounts of easily fermentable sugars, these glucoses. Mm. And uh, when you when you and when you dry hop, you're adding a little bit of oxygen into the beer. You know the the hop pellets. You know as you pour them in, a little bit of air gets carried into the beer as well. So now you've got active yeast, you've got some new fermentable sugar, and you've got a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of fermentation occurs. Unfortunately, um, from a brewer's point of view, uh, the yeast, uh, they start to undergo a little bit of growth. You know, with this fermentation, but all of the amino acids that they depend on for you know resupplying their nutrients and their in their cell membranes and so on, those have all been used up in the main fermentation. Mm. So they use this new, little bit of oxygen that comes in to synthesize more amino acids that they need to further this growth. Well, uh, that synthesis generates a compound we call acetohydroxy acid as intermediary and that is a waste product of the yeast and gets excreted into the beer in this case um, acetohydroxy acid is like i say it's a waste product the yeast won't touch it what what happens then is that acetohydroxy acid chemically oxidizes into diacetyl or pentane dione the other vicinal diketone and that's a purely chemical process governed by temperature and pH. The warmer the temperature, the uh, lower the pH, the faster that acetohydroxy will oxidize, chemically oxidize, not actually oxidize, uh, into diacetyl. Once it's diacetyl, then the yeast can clean it up. When a IPA brewer is dry hopping, and then as soon as that, you know, that two or three day dry hopping window is done they would cold crash the beer get it ready to package and what they would end up end up doing is packaging lots of acetohydroxy acid and as soon as that keg or bottle would warm up then it would chemically convert to diacetyl and they would have diacetyl in the package ah. so this is why this whole hop creep thing has really become an issue. It's it partly, you know, out percent alcohol TTB concern, but really more of a beer quality diacetyl problem. Sure. And just imagine how frustrating. I mean, brewers go through yeah. uh, painstakingly go through cleaning up their beer so that and, and measuring diacetyl, and then finding it in the in the in the packaging later. Yeah. They're all going, what the hell? Right. And so, yeah, yeah. that's that's where this this issue is reared its head. And I, th I think that it go a lot of it goes back to these lower kiln temperatures that we, they've been doing, trying to get more oil out of the hops. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and, and th thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, and, folks, like, once again, just a little plug here for our, our other new show, Hop and Brew School podcast. There is a whole episode on that as well where we talk to the folks from Yakima Chief Hops, and we, we cover this one in depth, uh, including yeah. some techniques at the end of the episode about how you might deal with this problem. So Very good. Yeah, check that out. All right, John, how about this? Can we take a quick break? We'll come back and we'll do some more. Excellent. All right. Very good. Hang in there. You're listening to Brew Strong, and we'll be right back with more of your questions and John Palmer's answers. 
it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20-gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your Brew Easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman Kettle Cart. The Brew Easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your Brew Easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new Brew Easy all-grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new Brew Easy. Back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. All right, a quick correction. That's that's one guy who knows how to turn beer into beer. <laughs> and that's that's my friend John Palmer here. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for hanging with us. I'm filling in for Jamil Zanishev for a couple shows here while he takes care of himself and gets better. Uh, he's doing all right. Don't worry too much about Jamil. Uh, yep. Not an STD. Yep. <laughs> As well, he said that anyway. Uh, yeah, but he's going to be okay. And uh, actually, I talked to him today. I, it sounds like we might see him at HomebrewCon as well. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I hope he makes it. Yeah, me too. Um, well, in the meantime, uh, John and I are holding down the fort here uh, with a Q and A show, and uh, let's get to another one. All righty. So Sean writes in. Uh, he says, "Hey guys, I am planning on diluting a beer with water." Um, and and well, I don't know why you do that. Uh, and he says, "And I seem to remember some issue regarding calcium that I need to be aware of." But what was it? Does the water need more or less calcium than the beer has? What do you think, John? Um, calcium shouldn't be an issue. Um, <clears throat> why would you want to add calcium? Well, I guess if you are targeting a certain water profile for your beer, um, and uh, when I talk about water adjustment, I talk about um, – you know, sulfate to chloride ratio, um, talk about um, mineral structure as being two components of the seasoning uh, effect that the minerals and water can have on your beer. Um, so if you're, gonna, if you're going to dilute your beer to make it a lower ABV, um, you might consider adding some additional calcium salt to the water uh, to kind of keep it, you know, same, same as before dilution in terms of that mouthfeel and that seasoning level. Um, but I, I don't think um, calcium is so much of an issue if you're going to be diluting your beer as uh, oxygen. Um, when you add, you know, water to a beer, um, you're adding roughly, you know, eight parts per million of oxygen to that beer as well, which can quickly cause it to go stale. Um, so at the very least, you should boil that water first. Now, a half hour boil, uh, or I mean, it doesn't have to be that long, maybe a good, you know, 10, 15 minutes will drive your oxygen levels out and reduce them to about one ppm, one part per million. Um, that still will end up uh, staling the beer in, you know, three to four or five months, somewhere in that time frame, uh, if you don't keep the beer cool. And put that in perspective, a 
you know, commercial brewer is looking for, you know, five to ten parts per billion in terms of packaged oxygen in their beers. So uh, one ppm, you know, not ideal, um, but it's certainly better than the eight to ten ppm that you would get if you didn't boil the water first. Got it. Okay, good advice. Okay. Here's one. Uh, now, the, the email, the question is titled Polyguile, but oh, yeah. is it Party Guile? No, in this case, we're talking Poly. I don't know. Oh, I've never heard of this one. What is Polyguile? Okay. Well, this is something that uh, our good friend John Blickman uh, and I cooked up uh, a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually... It's actually older than us. We didn't invent it. But okay. um, uh, Chris Colby talked about it in BYO a few years ago. Um, and it actually goes back to the British practice of party guile brewing, where you take a very large mash and divide it up between different beers. The difference here is that you're, at, you're doing poly instead of party, you know, part, instead of partitioning, we're actually mashing again. Mm, okay. And it's a good we it's a good method to build up high gravity worts for like barley wines, wee heavies, and so on. Um, what you do is you 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 know uh, do a mash, you know say ten pounds of grain, you know um, three to three or four to one uh, water to grist ratio, like you know two quarts per pound, two and a half quarts per pound, something like that. Um, you draw off that wort. And hold it, and then you take another 10 pounds of grain and use that wort to mash it with not additional water, but you use that that first wort to uh, do the second mash. I see. And what happens is, is that you effectively double your wort gravity that way. Okay. Um, there's the the equations and tables are in the current edition of how to brew, um, and that show you those relationships. But uh, yeah, John and I did an, you know, an experiment over the phone when I was working on the book that uh, verified all this, and we had a we have a Bruce Strong show on it too. I think the one we did uh, beginning of last year uh, or maybe the previous year. I'm not sure, but. Uh, yeah, very good technique for for generating high gravity wort. Um, you don't have to do long boils. You don't have to add malt extract. You simply do, you know, two or more sequential mashes using the wort as the liquid. Got it. You do have a lot of waste. I mean, there's still a lot of ends up being a lot of extract left behind, uh, which you could then sparge with additional water to make a separate beer that would be like a small beer that you could make from that but yeah great technique okay it's in the book <laughs> so it's also a john that writes in and and by the way he's from the maryland ale and lager technicians club he's the president uh, there um nice. malt of course um so he's got he's got a short question and a long question they're really the same um he, he wants to know how does he treat the mash water for the second batch Ah, but well, if I'm under, if I could just say, if I understood what you just said, there is no water for the second batch. There's just wort for the second batch. That, that's right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah. So you're you're mashing with that wort. So the all your water adjustment was done on the first batch. Got it. Okay. Well, that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. Just do it in the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and and when it comes comes to water adjustment in general, um, go to chapter what twenty one twenty two in How to Brew in the new edition. Look at the brew cube, and uh, that takes a lot of the mystery out of you know what it is you're trying to adjust when it comes to water adjustment. There we go. Easy enough. You can start out right. Um, Okay, here's another one. I found this one interesting. KJ wrote this in. He says, hi, guys. I'm KJ. Uh, I've been homebrewing for around nine years. Um, he says, I've searched for topics in Brew Strong over the years um, and just recently started a job with an hour commute. So I decided to just go back to the very first topic ever and make my way through the majority of the list. Wow. Uh, yeah, so he's listening all the way through, uh, gosh, over 10 years of shows with you guys. Yeah. Um, 
So he says, this led me to decide to ask a few questions. Uh, He says, through experimentation, um, I've found that adding things to fermenters post-high Krausen achieves a brighter, more fresh flavor. Uh, he says, yep. I'm, he says, I'm somewhat of a fanatic about sanitation. Um, I've done some prepackaged things like canned fruit and candy syrup straight from the package with good results. I've also done a vodka tincture with things like spices, cocoa nibs, orange peel, uh, and vanilla beans. He says, I'm curious, though, uh, of other methods of sanitarily adding things to a fermenter, more specifically dry items that clump up and would require stirring. Um, mm. You know, he, he gives some examples, uh, graham crackers. Um, he says, he's, I'm particularly interested in trying powdered cream cheese, <laughs> something that he's found. Um, uh, also, uh, fruit um, and so on. So uh, what do you think, John? How can, first of all, do you agree that uh, adding you know, ingredients post-Krausen uh, does g- achieve a brighter and more fresh flavor? Yeah, because you're not scrubbing a lot of the volatiles from that addition out. Um, you know, adding them in before fermentation, hmm. um, things like coffee and, you know, chocolate and so- certain fruits. Um, yeah, you can end up using, losing a lot of the aroma uh, due to the CO2 scrubbing that occurs during fermentation. So, yeah, I agree with them there that adding them post um can help that. Okay. When I uh, do fruit beers myself, um, I'll often do a secondary fermentation. That is, I'll do the main fermentation with just the beer, and then again after Croizen after you know towards the end of fermentation, then I'll add in the you know the fruit syrup or the fruit you know whatever form it may be in, mm-hmm. and essentially conduct a secondary fermentation of just that fruit, and that decreases the amount of loss of volatiles. Okay. All right. Well, then on to the, 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 the real question here. What about uh, sanitation with some of these uh, items that are more difficult to sanitize, like, you know, crackers or, or, uh, or powdered cream cheese? Yeah, crackers. Why the fuck would you use crackers? <laughs> well, he did specifically <laughs> say graham crackers, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Those things, well, crackers, any any wheat or grain cereal kind of thing, um, going to be potentially fermentable, but generally um, you're going to end up leaving some starches behind too. Mm-hmm. Starches can become food sources for bacteria. So even, you know, the, the only way you prevent that is really starting with a beer that's like uh, I forget I forget what the exact threshold is but I think it's somewhere above 5% uh, alcohol where you de- you know radically decrease the likelihood of bacterial contamination the alcohol level is high enough to prevent that even if there is like a starch source that they could feed on um and in general, that's going to hold true for like other fruits and fruit syrups and so on. Like if you were to throw a whole apple in there, you know, you'd have, you know, bacteria on the apple skin and so on um, that could potentially contaminate the beer. But again, with that alcohol level plus the hops in the beer are usually enough to uh, to keep that beer sanitary, prevent bacterial growth. Okay. Um, going into strange things like powdered cream cheese, I think you're going to run into other issues, um, mainly because of the fats, the fats and the oils are, you know, any, any fats and oils you add to beer, um, are going to reduce its shelf stability, its flavor stability. They're going to stale. Um, they're going to generate, you know, soapy, fatty, off flavors. So I really don't think you want to do that. Even um, some of these uh, peanut butter beers where they use defatted powdered peanut butter, um, those beers don't have the shelf life of a, no, of a regular beer. 
um, even though they've tried to remove some of those bad components, you know, the oils and so on, um, you're still, you still start running into flavor stability issues. Okay. So, yeah, um, high, after high croissant, if um, it's something that you are concerned about, you know, an ingredient that may have a higher potential for contamination or, say, a lower alcohol beer, then I would, and I would take that and add it basically to the whirlpool after the boil. Um, that way you can use the pasteurizing properties of the temperature of the whirlpool, mm-hmm. you know, anything above 100 and you know, 60 degrees for, you know, 10 minutes or so will pretty thoroughly pasteurize anything um, and knock down your contamination issues. Um, but because it's after the boil, you don't lose the volatiles that you're often looking for. Okay. All right. Good advice, and thanks for sending in the question, KJ. Yeah, good uh, question. By the way, as a reminder, you can send your questions into Brew Strong at the Brewing Network dot com, and those go to Jamil and John Palmer, and then they try to get through all of them for you. So don't be afraid to send in your questions. Um, how about one more before a break? Let's see. Tom writes in, uh, "Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for doing the show. It's been very helpful in my home brewing adventure." And he goes on to say, I've seen that Fermentus has a new E2U yeast procedure, which you're going to have to explain to me, John. Um, but he says, I rehydrate my yeast, so I'm a little skeptical. Is there some kind of new addition to this or non-rehydration, or is this just a selling point? Yeah, um, this is their new easy to use uh, line of ah. dry yeasts, and this this product line has been coming on for a couple of years now, um, or at least you know they've been gearing up for it. They've been talking about um, that. You know, the improvements in dry yeast manufacturing production and so on um, in the last, you know, five, ten years are such that um, you you have a much healthier uh, yeast cell going into fermentation. One that they have done uh, the, the nutrient buildup, the oxygenation, the aeration for you prior to um, drying it out so that when you pitch it to your wort um, that you don't need to rehydrate it first you can just pitch it you can take the dry yeast pour it directly into the fermenter Mm -hmm. uh, into your wort um, and that you don't need to aerate it because they did that aeration resulting in, you know, the sterile synthesis, the amino acid buildup and so on. All these things that yeast normally do during the lag phase of fermentation after you pitch them, they've done that ahead of time. So now you can take this, this easy-to-use yeast pour it directly in the fermenter, it slowly rehydrates itself from the wort uh, rather than pure water and um, is ready to go. It does very minimal growth, uh, physical growth that is, and taking in nutrients and so on uh, before it gets started reproducing and going into high fermentation. Okay. Now, Tom adds, you know, that he's a little skeptical about this. What do you think, John? I've been skeptical myself right up, I mean, right up through the present day. Um, The other yeast companies have also expressed a certain amount of skepticism. But, you know, uh, in theory, you know, based on an understanding of how yeast cells work, Mm -hmm. it sounds doable. It's just a question of how well you know, Fermentus or another yeast company can actually pull this off in terms of, you know, quality control, consistency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, You know, it's uh, not to compare it to Boeing or anything, but, uh, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I I think it is, I think it is doable. Um, Like, you know, 
yeast manufacturers have gotten a lot better at yeast processing in the last few years, and they're you know able to they're able to put more cells into a package mm. with higher vitality, higher viability. So um, they you know Fermentus has documentation on their website that supports. Um, the performance of this yeast. So um, give it a try. Yeah. You know, I should give it a try myself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let us know. You know, I'm not going to try it, John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the email, Tom. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, okay. How about we take a, a quick break and we'll come back and do some more questions. Alrighty. All right. Hang in there. You're listening to Bruce Strong uh, with Justin uh, Crosley filling in for Jamil and uh, the great John Palmer. Hang in there. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. Learning to brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong. Now that one sounds more like me, John. Yeah. I never really thought brewing to be disgusting. No, it's just the way you guys present it sometimes. Uh, Yeah, I suppose that's true. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, we are covering your listener questions here. Uh, Once again, you can send them into BrewStrong at thebrewingnetwork.com if you've got your own questions, and we'll uh, cover them in a future episode. Um, for now, we've got one from Chris, uh, who, who he's got some questions about uh, brewing classic styles. And uh, huh. luckily, I think, John, you know that book well enough to cover for Jamil here. Indeed. So Indeed. he does say, hi, Jamil and John. I'm a relatively new brewer and have a simple question regarding the recipes in brewing classic styles. Um, if a recipe, uh, for example, the Munich Hellas on page 52, has steeping grains in the extract recipe... Do you still include these in the all grain version? And so he gives a little uh, further on the example. So uh, the all grain version of Munich Hellas is the following. Uh, if he lists it as the following, if he should keep in the steeping grains, which would be um, it's about four and a half kilograms of continental Pilsner malt, uh, three hundred and forty grams of Munich malt, and one hundred and thirteen grams of uh, melanoidin malt. So I guess the question here is. Um, you know, is that steeping, that melanoid malt um, included if he goes all grain? Yes, it is. The way that we set up Brewing Classic Styles is that we traded out uh, the, the base malts for malt extract, either like pale malt extract, Pilsner malt extract, or Munich malt extract. Then when it came to the other components of the grain bill from the all-grain version, because these were all of Jamil's uh, all-grain recipes, um, they use various specialty malts. Mm -hmm. Um, Then those specialty malts are steeped for the extract version. Then it's all just mashed together for the all-grain version. So the all-grain recipe for the Munich Hellas is the Pilsner malt, the Munich malt, plus that 113 grams of melanoid malt. Um, which I think is like, what, a quarter pound? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Okay. All right, and I want to add on to this question, John. In the Sure. Uh, so on the extract side, um, what contributions are we getting from the steeping grains? Is it just color, or are we getting fermentables? Are we getting um, uh, flavor? What do you think? Yeah, well, you're getting flavor. You're Generally, you're not getting fermentables. Okay. Um, and, and it depends on the specific steeping grain. But um, basically, if you can steep it, um, it has been processed either by heat or um, stewing, you know, making a caramel malt out of it. Um, all of the, the readily fermentable sugars and starches 
that could be converted are have been incorporated into, say, uh, Maillard products, these melanoidins and other flavor compounds, um, or they've been caramelized into non-fermentables. So, yeah, uh, even even your low color caramel malts don't really contribute much in the way of uh, fermentables. All the all the fermentables have been converted into color and flavor compounds. Got it. Okay. Which could be dextrins, of course. Uh, they're still sugars, but they're just not fermentable. Yeah. Now, and John, having participated with that book, uh, obviously, I, I have another question. How and. Maybe this is kind of a silly question because I know you guys would only put out quality, but um, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess my question is the extract version of these beers next to the all grain version. Now, of course, uh-huh. there's going to be some differences in flavor, right? But yeah, what do you? How different do you think that is? Are they pretty damn close? They really are quite close. Yeah. Um, and um, in fact, a couple of years ago, I. I retooled some of the uh, recipes from Brewing Classic Style into my own uh, line of beer kits, which you can find at some brew stores around the country, um, Palmer's Premium Beer Kits. Nice. Um, And, you know, they're not going to taste exactly the same Mm -hmm. as the all-grain version, but they are still going to be a good taste in beer that is truly representative of a style. Which was the um, point of the book, exactly. Right? So, yeah, you know, yeah. To to emphasize that, um, back in two thousand seven, I think, at the Craft Brewers Conference in San Diego, if you remember that one, um, Dr. Michael Lewis gave a really good presentation that really stuck with me, and uh, he was talking about you know as a brewer. You make a decision every day when you brew. Am I going to brew the same beer or am I going to brew a different beer? And unless you do everything exactly the same as the previous brew, you're brewing a different beer. Now, it may be a very small difference, Mm -hmm. but, you know, you change, you know, ingredient levels, you change temperatures, fermentation, pitching rate, all of these factors that go into, you know, the ferment the brewing and fermentation of a beer. If you change any one thing, you've brewed a different beer. Right. So, with that in mind, yeah, recognize that an extract version of an all-grain recipe is going to be a different beer, but yes, it's going to be very similar. Okay. Well, and that's not even to mention that uh beer is an agricultural product and so even exactly you know, the yield from year to year would make a different beer right yeah yeah so. that, that's an excellent point too and that's when i bring up when i'm talking about um, fermentation and maturation and um, so on that yeah it, you know this this barley variety versus that barley variety different flavors mm-hmm. this maltster versus that maltster different flavors in the malt, you know, um, Brees's caramel malt versus Weirman caramel malt, the same, you know, relative color, color level are going to be different because they're grown from different barleys in different parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, uh, we need to keep in mind that beer is an agricultural product and it's going to vary every time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that gets us through our listener questions for this episode, but I've got another kind of beer-related question for you. All righty. I'm looking for advice and hoping that maybe our listeners would, too. I know that over the last uh, several years, John, you have traveled uh, the world uh, to go to different beer events, beer festivals, judging, conferences. Um, so, and this might be hard for you to do, but if if I had one trip to take... In a, in a given year, what, what, was, what was like your favorite? What, where should I go? Which of these festivals that you've been to should I go to? Ah, uh, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. I, I, I've been going down to Mexico a lot for the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, actually, for the last 10, really. The Ensenada Beer Festival in March is definitely one of the world's great beer festivals. Cool. Um. The 
Ensenada, if you're not familiar with Mexico in general, Ensenada is about an hour and a half south of the San Diego border. Um, it's right on the coast, and it is um, – well, all of the all of the the Baja California breweries have been you know brewing beer for uh, you know the last decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have easy access to San Diego. They know American styles real well. Um, frequently do collaboration brews. I mean, these guys are uh, some of the best of the best of Mexico brewers, and really, I mean, San Diego brewers for that matter. Um, they're top notch. Then you have the added benefit of being Ensenada, which is the uh, home of one of Mexico, Mexico's uh, culinary universities. Oh, nice. And so you have incredible food being taught there in town. Mm-hmm. You have It's a seaside town. They have great seafood. They have the Ensenada Beer Festival every year in March, around the third week. Okay. And so they set up with all these tents of brewers pouring beer, um, restaurants serving ceviche and sushi and all kinds of delicacies, um, and like three live bands playing, you know, great music. Wow. It's just an all-day great party. Okay. So I always look forward to that festival. You have convinced me. That sounds awesome. <laughs> good, like a good one. Yeah, and I've never been to Ensenada. I've been to several parts of Mexico, but never there. So, uh, yeah, it sounds beautiful. Nice town. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. And that's going to do it for our Q and A show today. Um, we will be back, of course, with more episodes uh, next month. And those, I think, John, we, we might be doing live from HomebrewCon, right? Yes, that's right. That'll be fun. Yeah. Always look forward to HomebrewCon. Yeah, me too. It's a, it's a very good time there. So uh, that's at the end of June. Don't forget to go get your tickets for BNA 14. You can get those at thebrewingnetwork.com. Uh, they're on sale now. And uh, you also, by getting a ticket, uh, you get a chance to win the More Beer official Brewing Network brew sculpture. So Excellent. I'll be excited to see who gets that. Um, yeah. All right, John Palmer, I will talk to you next time. Thank you so much. Bruce Strong, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong.